Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much. This is so weird. It's cool. I got this 360 camera. Everybody's so tiny. I'm probably tiny. So uh, anyways, um, thank you all for coming together this morning. Um, we're going to go ahead and try this. And obviously, if technology gets in the way, um, I will bow out um, because the most important thing is the meeting and that we get the work done. But I think, we'll, I think this will work. Let's try this out. So um, for those that don't know, real quick, I had uh, a COVID exposure two Saturdays ago um, and then tested positive last Thursday. So today is my last day of quarantining. Um, you will see me out in the town tomorrow and probably for the next week nonstop um, to get out of my house. But um, no, so, uh, so this is why I'm here and why you all are there um, and why uh, COVID is a real thing. And we need to make sure we're doing what we can to protect those that we love and ourselves. So um, with that said, um, we'll go ahead and uh, start the meeting. But before we get, let's do this. Um, I guess I can do this. Um, because I'm not voting, if we could uh, ask for a motion to allow members that are not there or that are there remotely to uh, vote, um, I'll look for that motion. Uh, okay, I, I, I need to check. Do we need to uh, do we need to have a motion first that somebody here chair the meeting until we take this vote, or can we just can we just go ahead and make the motion that? we can allow Vinny to participate. Right, so because, yes sir, so because uh, the chair and the vice chair are not physically present, you're gonna need to hold a vote to have someone sit as the chair, and then you can uh, lead the meeting after that. Okay, so can I get a motion for somebody to act as chair? So moved. Who? Uh, you can act as oh, chair. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you, can I, get, can I get a second? I'll second that. Yeah, I would like somebody to be chair too. <laughs> Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. So now I'm chair, and because our vice chair is not here and several other members aren't here, for the viewing public, they're stuck in a traffic jam on 95. When our vice chair gets here, she can take over the meeting. Is that correct? I'll check with the lawyer. Yes, sir. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Well, my understanding is once you hold the vote with a, um, uh, a quorum in the room, to allow people to vote virtually, then Vinny can continue on as, you know, can take back over his chair. Okay, great. Okay, so can we have a motion now to allow Vinny to vote, vote virtually? So moved. Second. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so now Vinny is legal and he's home, right? And so he's now back as chair? Okay, good. Thank you for that great year of service. Yeah, I was going to say, Dr. Winter, thank you for your five minutes of chairing there. Um, good stuff. Um, all right, thank you very much for that. So we do have a full agenda, so let's go ahead and get started. We'll start with a roll call. Carol, please. Okay, good morning. Uh, Lorraine Koss. Here. Uh, Vinny Toronto. David. Here. David Scherer? Here. John Windsor? Here. Terry Casto? Here. Um, Loralee Thompson? Here. Kimberly Newton? Here. Courtney Barker? Here. Todd Swingle? Uh, let's see. Uh, David Lane has asked to be excused. He is not well. Um, and, and Dennis Basile has uh, sent his resignation in. So he is not going to be here. I believe, Dennis. And I believe we have a quorum. I hope I didn't miss anyone. There are a couple of stragglers. They're stuck on 95, as uh, was mentioned before. Okay. Uh, thank you, Carol. Um, You're welcome. So we will go ahead and we'll move, we'll move through. So the approval of the agenda. I'll look for a motion to approve the agenda. Motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? All right. Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Passes unanimously. All righty. So now we'll go to the approval of the minute. A motion to approve the minute. 
Motion to approve. Second. Okay, we've got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Looks not. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, pass it. All right, so let's go ahead and go with the progress and fiscal reports from Virginia. Okay, thank you. Um, so my progress report is gonna be very short because this is our quarterly uh, performance review time. So I don't, I'm not gonna duplicate those. My first announcement was gonna be Dennis Basil's resignation. He's um, been asked to take on additional tasks and you know, when you take on new stuff, you gotta let some other stuff go. So um, he is still with us in spirit and um, uh, wanting to support us in any way that he can, but uh, needs to resign from his post. So we will uh, work on advertising and refilling that position. If you know uh, good candidates to represent real estate, uh, please, please reach out to them and ask them to keep an eye out um, for that posting. Um, the last meeting we talked about the governor's announcement of eight wastewater grants um, to the county out of, or sorry, nine out of 16 in the Indian River Lagoon uh, are coming to Brevard County. Eight of those were septic sewer projects. One was a, a wastewater treatment plant project. Um, uh, I received a map that showed the distribution of projects statewide. And you know, there was nice little dots all around the state of Florida. And then there was this giant cluster here. So um, just wanted you to be aware of that. Um, so leaping down to the bottom of the page um, on the state innovative technology grants, uh, full submittals were done in October 15th. Um, we've, we've held a kickoff meeting for the grant funded remote algae bloom sensing study. This is the one with the satellites starting in January. We're hoping to have weekly satellite images of bloom conditions in the lagoon. And we'll also have a historical analysis of blooms um, in Brevard County since the start of those satellite images about five years ago. Um, and uh, Crystal has uh, done um, an incredible amount of work closing out our old fiscal year and getting our new fiscal year set up. We are adding staff. I um, got approved to add a few staff, um, one accounting clerk to help keep up with the invoices as the pace of these projects and the number of invoices to process continues to climb and climb. Um, we're also going to add another staff to assist with the muck projects. We have awarded the Sykes Creek project and so, and um, uh, O'Galley is about to go to bid, so we will have multiple projects underway at once and need to staff up there. And then we are also gonna be adding an environmental section supervisor to help uh, rodeo the, the, uh, the troops. So um, that's, that's very exciting. I'm looking forward to it uh, tremendously. So I wanted to let you know. Um, November is Manatee Awareness Month in the state of Florida. Uh, you're aware of the manatee crisis that's been going on out there and as the temperatures cool, the water cools and manatees return to our warm water sites where there is a lack of food. Uh, the agencies are anticipating um, another peak in mortality. So we are uh, coordinating with the state and federal agencies on what we can do to assist and, and I'll try to keep you informed as that evolves. Um, Indian River Lagoon Day was, was last Saturday. Um, we had a number of staff there, including Brandon, and uh, I hear it was extremely well attended. Um, good good um, number of people coming through during the entire day, so that was wonderful. And then the other thing I wanted to highlight was the celebration, the ribbon cutting celebration of our 50th project at Sherwood Stormwater Park. Um, and I want to say thank you to a number of uh, 
citizen oversight committee folks that attended that. I don't know if um, you all want to say anything, but it, it seemed to come off quite well for our first ribbon cutting event, so uh, we, we were pleased. It, it was an awesome event. Uh, it, the park's well done, and it, it, I, I like the self-guided tour aspect of it. And uh, I think that uh, the people who were there, uh, the representatives, uh, really deserved the recognition that they got. And it was nice to see the public that was there that was participating in the project, too. Thanks for having that celebration. I don't know who had the idea of doing the 50th, but it was a great idea. I, I agree. It was a great event. I definitely recommend to anyone who has any interest or connection at all to go out and take a walk through the site. It's beautiful and extremely impressive, so definitely worth your time to go check it out. Yeah, I thought it was an ideal project to demonstrate because you had the walking path, you had the rain gardens, there's so many components to it. You know, probably, then people could relate to it probably much more than looking if we went to a uh, septic to sewer. You know, there's not much you can see, right? It's underneath the ground. So it's a really, really ideal one. I'll just add, you know, we had, the, it's the city of Melbourne's project. And so um, the city did a tremendous amount of work setting up the, the event. Um, the mayor spoke, the vice mayor spoke, another council person spoke, the assistant city manager spoke. Um, they had loads of staff there with the VAC truck there to demonstrate, um, you know, what it takes to maintain a baffle box um, in addition to the, the ponds and, and the polishing rain garden. So um, many, many thanks to Melbourne for helping to make that happen. I just wanted to add, I, I spoke to, I think it was Julie, the coordinator, and she uh, is interested in trying to get some um, equipment in there for children, make it more of a, you know, kids activity park, uh, which I think is a good idea. I do think they're going to need to fence that because I heard a story already about a young kid in the neighborhood playing. And there's a, if you've seen the site, there's a place where it's fairly easy to just sort of slide down into the into the waterway. So but uh, yeah, it, it really was impressive and a great ceremony. Um, I was just going to say that that um, Terry brings up an interesting point, and I think that one, as we build more and more stormwater um, parks, um, that we need to be aware of and even develop some, you know, better management practices for them or better development practices of those stormwater bodies, um, because it, it does become an issue. Um, and we certainly don't want to start fencing them all off because that takes away from their ability to be a public amenity. Okay. Yes, is important. Okay, great. Yeah, this particular location has uh, a lot of green space that's open and accessible, um, but I definitely agree with what you said in implementing best management practices through safety, absolutely. It's a, it's a key issue. And if I can suggest if that would even be a topic for one of our speakers, you know, to really start to look at that. I know it's an issue where I am, so in Coco. Okay, I'm not sure there's the best management practices for kids. In Indy Atlantic, I think we had a bird bath in between. And I think within an hour, there were kids in there jumping around more than there were birds. So, um, but uh, but I think I think that was awesome. And thank you all for attending. Um, it is important to celebrate the work that we've done and also the work that Virginia and her staff continue to do. So I think that's a, a great way to do it. All right. So Virginia, were we? Uh, oh, did you finish the progress report? Did you have more? No, nope, that's that's it for me. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so now we'll go on to Crystal with our uh, monthly revenue graph.
so. Can you hear me, Vinny? Yes, I can hear you now. Thank you. All right. Um, we are nearing the, the end of receiving revenue for the last fiscal year. Um, we did just, um, we're at 220, but we received the discretionary. Um, in a couple weeks, we will receive that final um, revenue. But the discretionary was at 2.4 million, which puts us at 222.9 million in revenue this year and still growing. Um, our expenditures for last year reached 14.5 million and we're at a total of 34. This shows our breakdown. Uh, Crystal, yes. where does the discretionary come from? What's the source of that? We receive it quarterly and it has to do with um, items bought outside of Brevard County being brought back to Brevard County. In other words, say you go and buy furniture in Orlando and you have it shipped to us, um, there is a way that they track it. It's some wonderful magic that I do not know. Yeah. And um, I just know we receive the tax because... It's an interesting term for it. So yes, it is. Tax. Yeah, I just call it quarterly. Yeah. Quarterly <laughs> distribution in addition to the monthly. It's for a bad day, right? I mean, because it takes them a while to track it down and collect it. It's for three months. Yeah. Okay. So, Thank you. you're welcome. We are missing a slide. Okay. It is, however, is your flash drive in here? Yeah, click where you just were and go to... While we wait, Terry, if you can remember to turn your mic on, um, I know, uh, I just want to hear your voice um, when you're talking. Is there an agenda folder on there? I'm opening. Are you speaking to me, uh, sir, Mr. Chairman? I, I think when you say Mr. Chairman, you're referring to Dr. Windsor. I think you should say X there, but yes, no, of course. Yeah, thank you, Terry. All right. Um, with our quarter, we will be going into more detailed um, uh, as we do the actual progress report. This is just the summary table of our revenues and how we receive them. And... Yes, this is the wrong month. So, we will not look at that. <laughs> All right, um, I do believe it, it should have been sent out in your packet. I do not have a chance to share it. Um, it's, it's not in this grouping, but if not, we will send out additional. Yeah, it's not in the packet. Okay, it's not in the packet. All right, so um, it's just a summary of what you're about to hear of what um, all of our expenditures and revenues were for this year and a nice little bundled packet of how much was um, our overall capital projects, overall aid to private agencies, and operating projects. It's just a small breakdown. Outside of that, I am, I am done. Any questions? All right, Vinny, it's all you. Okay, Crystal, thank you very much for that. All right, so now we'll go on to the project performance table update from Terry.
have the uh, quarterly progress report update for July through September. Um, we have the Palm Bay North Area Wharf uh, Wastewater Treatment Facility uh, for reclaimed water currently under construction. Let me see if I can move this. Maybe there. Okay. Um, this is um, almost finished with construction. Um, they just asked for a six-month extension, so they should be finished by April at the latest. But during this quarter, the, um, they completed their hydrostatic testing on the anoxic and equalization basins. Um, the pumps, conduit, and wiring was installed. They've started um, doing some of the safety measures with the stairs and handrails, and um, they've started initial site restoration. The Titusville uh, Osprey Wastewater Treatment Facility, um, the contractor poured the floor for the treatment unit and they're tying the steel reinforcement for the walls and the yard piping has been laid. The Ray Bullard um, Biological Nutrient Removal um, Project uh, was permitted last, or I'm not permitted, um, contracted last quarter, and permitting is about 95% complete, and design is about 30% complete for this project. Anthony? So we started making um, a lot more progress on the sewer projects. Um, we have uh, the Sykes Creek zone in, which is on um, Northeast Merritt Island, um, Banana River Drive area. The 75% review um, was just uh, um, finished and completed this week by utilities and it's sent back to the engineers. So they'll be progressing and within a few months, we should be getting close to 90 and seeing the finish line. Um, South Central Zone C, um, we just had our pre-construction meeting uh, Monday. They've got their notice to proceed. The contractor's out buying uh, supplies and um, should be trying and they assured us they'll be finding supplies and we'll be able to start breaking ground at the new year. Um, this is South Central Zone C is the Indian River Isles community on uh, US-1 just north of Pineda. Um, the Miko sewer line extension, um, it just went out to bid yesterday, so um, we should be, um, you know, breaking ground in six months or so. And um, the Sykes Creek Zone T, uh, we've uh, moved forward with land acquisition. We have a parcel contracted. We're going through the environmental review now and um, just making sure we, um, you know, cross our T's, dot our I's. Um, and then, um, in the greater uh, scheme of things, the sewer projects are um, um, starting design as a um, giant lump um, for all of our county projects. So that um, task order was just um, finalized this week. So we'll be seeing um, a lot more progress on all those in the coming months. So. Um, what's going on in Titusville? I never see Titusville reported. Are, is the county working with homeowners in Titusville or what's going on up there? They have um, a couple septic sewer projects that they are managing. I don't know if you, you probably have updates. Yeah, the Titusville A through G project. Um, yeah. H isn't contracted yet, but the A through G project is contracted and they are currently in the land acquisition phase for their force made. Um, they're working with the county right th now f and doing the surveying work for that. The design is, give me one second, I think around 90% complete for that. Yes. Yeah, so um, it's moving along. Mm -hmm. um, for the upgrades and quick connects, uh, we're really starting to um, power through these. Uh, we have um, sent out a number of postcards and we're getting um, a constant influx of interested people and contracts. So um, there's, um, and then for the quick connects, these also include um, RV and mobile home parks. And we just had um, one completed and um, paid out. So, and uh, we have another uh, one coming under contract. So we're having um, um, giant bulk um, uh, 
basically what we call quick and next, but tiny septic sewer projects within these uh, mobile home parks um, coming on board. Danny's going to speak for the Melbourne projects. So we've had a little bit of uh, forward motion out on our three um, projects, um, getting a few more folks connected. We're also currently working on our um, homeowner policy for our septic sewer conversions. This will allow homeowners not to have to find $15,000 to connect a sewer. We're going to help offset those costs by working directly with the contractor themselves. The homeowners will still maintain the pumps, um, still be all of their responsibility, but they don't have to come up with that upfront cash. I'm hoping to be able to take that policy to our council um, in December. Um, we're waiting on some final attorneyized documents, and we all know how fast those move. Um, so hopefully we'll have uh, a little more homes connected by this time um, in the next quarter. Could I, could I ask, is that 15000 initial cost going to be covered through city funds, stormwater funds? Where is that responsibility for that? So currently, break? if you wanted just to, to convert your system over and there was sewer available, it's cost between fifteen and $30,000. That's, that's what the costs are running right now based upon our construction. So um, depending upon which project location you are and how it is funded depends upon how much funding we have available for each each location so there are some projects that have that was much cheaper to put the force main in so we have more funds for the homeowners we have other places where it's more expensive to put the force main in so we don't have quite as much but those are funded through soil projects the ease we have a 319 grant for some homeowners and then we're just using stormwater utility funds for others and then we have some legislative funds that's dictated specifically to infrastructure so we're trying to use all the available funding sources um, that we have available to maybe make this happen. Uh, Fifteen to 30,000 is for uh, connection to a force main? Yes, sir. And what's the, what's the comparable number for gravity feed? We don't have any of those. So all of the sewer projects that we've targeted are all low pressure force mains because typically our problem is, is that there is a, there isn't any gravity sewer that we can run to them because it's too, they're at the end right, of right. a line. Or B, the houses sit below our existing gravity sewer. So you have to pump okay. it. You so how about re-swept? Reswept was gravity feed, right? Do we have the history of what we spent there? So for our <clears throat> our quick connect costs for people connecting to gravity have been in the nine to twelve range. Okay. Um, you know, there's some outliers on both ends, but thank you. Yeah, the biggest portion of those costs are the abandonment of the septic tanks, to be very truthful. The pump stations aren't as expen super expensive and your laterals aren't super expensive unless you have two hundred year trees. And then it gets more expensive because you got to go around the tree. Um, but it's the abandonment of the tanks because they're not always very easy to get to. And what's the determination for that uh, assistance for the upfront cost? Um, we know how much funding we have for each project, and we divide it by the number of homes. Okay, so I meant for the homeowner, though. Is there any kind of qualification process, or is it just anyone who's if interested? If you are part, if you have been identified, your, your location has been identified as an area of concern, then that's how that works. And you mentioned the resolution that's going to the development council? We have to take a council policy to allow for this type of homeowner reimbursement process. Okay. It's kind of like our SHIP program for our um, CDBG funds. So we use that as a template to move forward, um, but it has to be approved by uh, council. And so we're, we're hoping to take that on the next council agenda for or the first meeting in December, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure it's going to make it, but that's our hope. Once it's once it's finished, yes. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, moving on to stormwater projects. Uh, Basin 26 and Basin 62 just recently broke ground um, this week, I believe. So they are currently under construction. They're up in the um, Scottsmore area. Um, Cocoa Beach Convair Cove is about 49% complete. Um, you can see here they laid the pavers um, and they have the rain tanks underneath to collect the rain. And I have a nice video here that Jessica shared showing the pavers in action with the recent rainstorm. You can see all of this runoff is flowing this way 
instead of going directly into the lagoon like it used to. So it's pretty exciting, yes. <laughs> And then um, the Satellite Beach uh, Jackson Court Stormwater Treatment Facility project was recently completed. And the Titusville High School Baffle Box is also under construction. Um, this one should be completed soon. Yeah, the road's open now. Okay, good. <laughs> and the Ray Bullard Stormwater Reclamation Facility project um, is also under construction. This one is about 49% complete as well. Um, they've completed all the demo work. Um, the contractor has installed uh, storage supply lines between the storage tanks and the um, transfer station and um, completed the excavations about 55% complete and um, the out stormwater outfall pipes have been installed. Walker. Morning, everyone. Um, I'll give you a quick update on the dredge projects. Grand Canal, we're currently almost as of probably today, they probably dredged over 150,000 cubic yards. Um, there's 480,000 total, so we're getting there. Um, they will be shutting down November 30th for the, the seasonal manatee closure that's required by our permits. So they're working diligently to, to try and make up as much ground as they can before um, before December 1st, then they'll be shut down till through March 15th. Sykes Creek, as Virginia noted earlier, um, the contract is awarded. Um, we have to go through the rigmarole of the, the contract review process before it's executed. Um, one of the caveats to this project is the state is currently occupying portions of the Kiwanis Island Park with the monoclonal antibody treatment as well as COVID testing. Um, we met with the park supervisor actually yesterday. Um, as it currently stands, they will, the state is going to circle back with the parks department at the end of the holiday season to figure out whether or not um, they're still going to occupy that space. So we're going to be in a holding pattern until, you know, the, the state no longer occupies that, that particular portion of this park because as it stands, where they have their facility set up is exactly where our contractor is going to be working once once they get going. So it's a, it's a hurry up and wait situation. Whole new form of COVID delay. Yeah, yeah. Which is also obviously it's a benefit to the to the community. So um, we'll, we'll just wait and see what happens there. Um, O'Galley should be going out to bed bid in the next couple months. Um, there was something I wanted to tell you about O'Galley, and I can't remember what it was. No. Oh, we're, we're still, actually, yes, it was, thank you. Um, we are still waiting on a permit from the Corps. Um, it's been months now, uh, it's been radio silence, so I, I don't know when we're gonna get a, get a response from the Corps. I know all the regulatory agencies are swamped like everyone else right now, so. Um, hope to have something in the next month or so. Any questions? All right, thank you. Dawson, real quick, the manatee period, that starts November 30th, and when does it run through? So it starts December 1st, and it runs through March 15th. So we can't do any any dredge work during that period in time. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, the Cocoa Beach Phase 2B muck uh, project is still underway right now. Um, they recently completed Canal 27, um, which is shown here in the picture, and they have removed um, over 11,000 cubic yards of material, and they continue to remove the material from their dredge material management area this quarter. Um, the zoo had a few oyster projects underway this month, so um, between the Central Oyster Project, the North, North Oyster Project 2, and the Central Oyster Project 2, they've um, added an additional uh, 4,086 square feet of um, oyster bar this, this quarter, so they, did, they were very busy. And we also completed, this is under the education back at the top, but I put all the oysters together. The oyster gardening contract um, was recently completed for this um, fiscal year. 
So overall, and since this project's inception, they've held uh, 78 workshops with over 1,500 gardeners trained. And this past fiscal year, um, they held 13 events and 17 volunteer uh, prep events, which is like the bagging events and deployment events. So I think that's, oh, and the overview. Uh, here we go. Um, we have the two completed projects, so the Jackson Court and the Oyster Gardening um, for here. And then we've got about 11,000 uh, pounds of total nitrogen reduction per year w uh, within this last quarter. So, any questions? Are there any uh, are there any <laughs> updates on the condition of like the Oyster Bar? Like, is it healthy? Is it growing? Is there spat? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, they're doing well. Yes. And that picture was um, that, so go one? back to the, the round circle, right? Mm -hmm. Those are little tiny, you know, Bellager oysters just growing a foot and, and settling. So, yeah, so we've, we finally, or the zoo with their partners have finally got um, uh, spawning working again. There was a hiatus there. Um, with multiple uh, hatchery facilities struggling to get oysters to spawn for you know a year and a half, but it's they're back in action. So, Virginia, to follow up on Kimberly's question, is there something the zoo could provide us on twelve month mortality slash you know breeding of these oysters just to get an idea of how these projects are doing in terms of you know uh, the oysters? continuing to propagate? So we typically provide that um, on, in the monthly report. So, and, and Jenny is in training today, that's why she's not here to give you um, a, a more complete study, but uh, the living shoreline performance, so the University of Florida monitored the Wexford and Maritime Hammock oyster bars. Um, they have grown at the Wexford site, and there was uh, just shy of 17% increase in the number of oysters counted at the Maritime Hammock um, since the previous quarterly monitoring. So every month, um, they uh, UCF, we're paying UCF as a third party to monitor the zoo sites. They are visiting different sites. So every month, you'll get a little report of which sites they visited and what they found there. That's great. Thank you. Okay. And if you want more, we can send you the 30-page reports. But we, <laughs> we distill that down to one little bullet. So. Brandon, you're up next. So, Vinny, that was the end of the, uh, the quarterly progress report. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Terry. And I think, Virginia, to David's question, I think it was Kimberly's question, I did reach out to Ashley Reardon uh, at the Brevard Zoo about the oysters. And I, I, I wondered if there was a way that we could distill it down to some sort of graph or chart, because I think a lot of people say, oh, yeah, they're doing the oysters, but they're dying or they're the spat isn't going, and I, I wonder if there was a way that we could have some sort of long-term number um, that we could point to people to say, no, look, this is an uptick, or even if it's a downtick, but just to give us some ability to point that out to other people. Yeah, we, we also have a slide that compares um, the, it's about a dozen sites that we've been visiting quarterly since their installation, and some of those are over two years old now. Um, and so we show, you know, how many oysters did we initially place there and what the size class of those oysters were versus how many oysters were there uh, the last time it was visited by UCF and what those size class breaks down, uh, size class breakdowns are uh, most recently. And so, uh, the majority of those sites are holding their own or doubling in the number of live oysters uh, thriving at those sites. We've had two sites that have not done as well. Those are both in canals, and so the zoo is no longer doing projects in canals uh, based on that information. But we can, we can certainly share that graph with the, with the committee. 
Okay, great. Yeah, I, I, I knew they were doing well. I think it's, it's good for us to have that historical um, look at, at that as it's progressing. But, okay, thank you. All right, um, Brandon, I think we're going to do our project video, Cocoa Beach Convair Cove Low Impact Development. Is that correct? Yes. All right, take it away. We are currently standing in one of Cocoa Beach's uh, oldest subdivisions here, Conbear Cove. Um, we are retrofitting this area to put in some stormwater LID or a low impact development in order to help the water from the rain and stormwater get into the ground rather than into the lagoon. So yeah, in places that are already built up, we essentially want to capture the water where it falls, okay? Keep it in that area rather than having it transfer to another area where there's really nowhere for it to go. So it causes a lot of flooding um, and other water quality issues that we've seen in our area. This way we can get, not only get the water into the ground, but we can also provide treatment for that water. The pavers are, are basically uh, infiltration type pavers. There's, there's gaps between them so the water can freely flow into the ground and uh, there's gravel beneath the pavers so that gives you more volume the gravel takes some of the load also and then as it passes through the system through the R tanks it's going to enter into our gabion baskets that we have in there we have bioactivated media the bioactivated media is going to serve to be a place for a little bacteria that will help to uh, take down the nutrient concentration of that water. So we have two retention areas, one on the north and one on the south side. So the city wanted to determine which is the best to use. So they determined that they would do on the north pond, they'd do the bold and gold on the south, they would do the, the wood pulp mix to determine, you know, if there was enough removal rate that they would go ahead and expend more money Money for that media in future projects. We have some um, pre-construction water quality monitoring so we can get a baseline of the nutrients that are in that water and then we're doing post-construction monitoring. In this way we can compare those and see the effectiveness of our system. So this is just one of many projects that we're doing using the Save Our Indian River Lagoon half cent sales tax. Besides the projects that we're doing to reduce nitrogen and phosphorus, we also have things that residents can do to be a part of the process and help remove those nutrients in their own home. So if they go to lagoonloyal.com, they can find simple actions that they can do, such as installing a rain barrel in their home or washing their car in a commercial car wash or reducing their fertilizer usage. Those things can all add up to help improve the lagoon. Not only can they feel better about helping the lagoon, but they can also earn points that they can then redeem to get discounts at local businesses through our Lagoon Loyal program. Thank you very much, Brandon. Good video. Yes, Lorraine, go ahead. Yes, yeah, wondering, do we have any, um, have we tracked how many people are actually taking advantage of the incentives, the point system? Do we have any data on that? Yeah, all of that gets recorded. They give us a monthly report and saying how many actions have been taken and uh, I don't have the numbers offhand right now, but. Okay. Hey, hey, Brandon. Yep. Uh, right. I hope this is an urban myth, but uh, is with respect to uh, pavers for for driveways, does Melbourne Code require a, a cement slab under the impervious pavers? That, we happen to have somebody from Melbourne who can answer that. <laughs> Sorry. So pavers in the right. So the city of Melbourne traditionally does not allow pervious pavers, concrete, or asphalt um, because they are a maintenance-driven product. And unless um, those property owners understand what they're doing and how long that has to be maintained, they traditionally don't work in our area. Um, our soils are super sandy. Everyone knows that. We have lots of trees and we have leaf debris. Now, on a private homeowner site, if they want to just put pavers in their driveway just so they're pretty. On their property, they do them just like you traditionally would. Anything in the right-of-way underneath the sidewalk and out into the right-of-way has to be set on concrete because we have to allow for H30, H23 loading. So we have 
proper trucks and sidewalks. So if somebody drives over the sidewalk section, it doesn't get broken, and then we have a trip hazard. But a private driveway can be part of not under, between the house and the right of way line. It does not. No. Okay, mm-hmm. Thank you for dispelling myth, Terry. Uh, was that uh, Laura Lee? Did you have a question? Yeah, I was just going to ask Brandon, are we seeing an increase, month-to-month um, -month increase in people that are taking advantage of Lagoon Loyal coupons and stuff, or is it just kind of steady? It's been kind of steady. So we're uh, talking with the team at MTN right now to see what kind of actions we're going to do this next year to try to increase the usage at Lagoon Loyal. So we're working with them now, and they have a couple ideas on that. So. All right, thank you very much. So now, Virginia, it looks like we're going to go to our uh, latest revenue projection update. Right, and, and so my hope is that we can kind of flow straight from revenue projections, project funding and substitution options, um, and uh, then Terry's presentation of funding requests, all of that to feed into the committee's discussion of the the funding requests and your recommendations. So thank you, Terry, for pulling up the slides. So as um, Crystal indicated, we continue to collect more this year than we anticipated. You know, when we budgeted for this year, uh, we had no idea where uh, the pandemic was going to take us, and we were conservative. Um, and so at this point, we have collected 11 of the 12 months in the fiscal year 2021. Um, so I used the, the latest 6.2% inflation to estimate the 12th month of the year. And based on that, uh, we would collect $5,159,403 more than what was anticipated and budgeted and, and included in the plan. Um, based on that quarterly discretionary income that just came in, uh, this number is probably low. So I think this is a very safe number for the committee to use as available funds to allocate to projects. All right, and then uh, Terry went through, let me see if I can. See if, see if that works. Um, went through, and for the projects that were completed during the last year, several of those were completed under budget. So these four projects were completed under budget. The amounts are the amounts that they did not request for reimbursement because they were completed under budget. So we have $37,741 of savings. That, that money is also available for allocation to new projects. All right, this is a list of all of the projects that have been completed this year. And so you'll recall that for every project in the plan, we set aside a 5% contingency. And some people use uh, contingency and, and some projects don't. And so the right-hand column is the amount of contingency that was used or you know allocated to complete those projects, sometimes expand those projects like Sherwood Park. Uh, instead of treating two neighborhoods, they were able to treat three neighborhoods. And so uh, that increased uh, load reduction benefit was, was funded um, through contingency funds that were, were uh, recommended by the committee. Um, and signed off by the county. And so uh, when you do the math here on the amount of contingency funds that were budgeted for those projects minus the contingency funds that were used for those projects, there's another $18,145 left over available for reallocation. All right. so. Um, the first three lines are those three numbers that we just talked about, uh, 5 million in excess revenues collected this year, 37,000 of savings on completed projects, and then 18,000 of contingency that was not 
used or, or allocated. So that gives you $5.2 million uh, that you could allocate today. Uh, recognizing that the number of requests coming in uh, is 16 million, um, we went through the plan to look at what projects you know, in, pre in previous years, you've asked us to, some, some projects have been on the books for years and they're not moving and, you know, what's going on. And Terry's done a great job reaching out to uh, those partners and getting uh, the majority of those projects moving and under contract. Um, these are ones that have not moved. So um, the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station Rapid Infiltration Basin project, uh, we, we have toured the site. We have met with the Air Force. Um, they, their mission is rockets and space. And so um, th they have a very hard time asking for funding to go above and beyond what is required um, for their wastewater treatment needs. Additionally, the new mandates of Senate Bill 712 are going to require this site to upgrade. And so uh, you'll recall uh, last year we had a discussion about um, providing funding for private package plant upgrades and uh, there was direction of you know looking at how Senate Bill 712 affected those facilities and not funding what they were going to be mandated to do anyway, uh, reserving our funding for doing for going above and beyond. So for the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, when we look at what they're mandated to do and then what could be achieved going above and beyond, uh, this project just is not very cost effective. And I have another slide on that to show you, but I, I want to just run through these three quickly. The Port St. John treatment plant, um, the, the county's utilities is taking a rate resolution forward. You may have seen that in the news. The legislative intent was approved uh, at the last meeting and it's going to go through the public hearing process. Um, that will include funding to make some major changes at that Port St. John treatment plant um, and uh, upsize it so that it has the capacity to treat a lot more homes. And so making changes in the rapid infiltration basin um, could be in the way or torn up, that the timing is just not right. You know, it'll probably take the life of this tax to make those planned improvements um, at the Port St. John facility. And so we would need to wait until all of that is done and the dust is settled. Um, and in the meantime, you could put that money to work on, on other projects that could move forward sooner. Um, for the septic to sewer projects, COCO Zone C, that is the least cost effective project in the plan. And based on the latest cost estimates, um, it's also a, a very high cost per pound. So um, this is more detail on those three projects. So you'll see with the Cape Canaveral, um, Canaveral Air Force Station, the, their, their current TN concentration in their effluent uh, is uh, just under 12 milligrams per liter. Um, when they comply with Senate Bill 712, they will have to be under three milligrams per liter. So I just took the delta 12 milligrams to three milligrams is one quarter, took the pound reduction divided by four, um, and then you know showed how that affects the cost per pound. So it drives the cost per pound for that project up from $1,100 per pound to $4,500 per pound. The Port St. John treatment plant, um, you know, that looks like it should be a really cost-effective project. It's just the timing is, is wrong with the other uh, improvements that are planned for that site. And then Coco C, you'll see that the total cost there has risen to $18 million, and that means that the cost per pound for that project is over $5,000, um, whereas you know, what is proposed on the, the new projects in front of you is to increase the, the cost share for existing septic sewer projects to $1,500 per pound. Mm -hmm. Uh, so in the Cocoa Sea, is that begins where Cocoa proper 
ends and goes up to MIMS? Yeah. Is that the geographic area? So this is, thank, thank you for that leading question. Here's a map. <laughs> um, so you can see where the Port St. John treatment plant is near the top of the map. And then the green areas are currently funded septic to sewer projects. So we need to up uh, size the plant to break, bring on additional capacity for the Sharps A septic to sewer project and the Sharps B septic to sewer project, you know, and then any other uh, new development that might tie into that system. The Coco C project is kind of the end of the line. It requires Sharps A to proceed before the lines would uh, get down to Coco C. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, I have more details if you, if you want more details, but that was kind of the, the overview to, to set you up. And then I was going to have Terry go through the, the projects um, and explain how we arrange the, the spreadsheet. Virginia? Let's, yes. Qu qu quick question. Uh, first of all, thank you for that incredible analysis, for going through every one of those with the detail and insight. It was really helpful. What kind of timeline do you imagine it would take to get to cover Coco C, given Coco a, the Sharps A having to be done first and so on? How, how many years out to get um, that done to see? You know, I, I would say four to five at a minimum. Yeah. Let me ask, did they become eligible for you know, if we're not going to fund those, then they become eligible for upgraded septics? Yes, yes, advanced septic. They would immediately become eligible for those. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. I'm going to pull up the um, project table that was given to everybody. And while Terry does it, I, I did talk to Virginia about this, and so once Terry finishes this, we can have our discussion on the project and and figure out how we want to uh, tackle this um, this next step. Okay, so the table you have um, was organized. Uh, or, or sorted, I should say. These are all the project applications. And then we did eligible tax funding, uh, dollar per pound of total nitrogen as the first sort. So these um, increase, smallest to largest. Our second sort was total cost, smallest to largest. And then the third sort was TN reduction, largest to smallest. Um, so we have our first couple are uh, vegetation harvesting, right here, or the first three, sorry. Um, one, two from, sorry, there's actually three, uh, or four. Um, two from the county and two from the city of Cocoa Beach. Our next one, we have the Titusville Causeway uh, Living Shoreline Restoration Project. And you'll see our cumulative funding column does not add this uh, eligible cost share increase because that funding is going to be coming from the 10 million living shoreline projects. So that's, that money's already set aside for those types of projects. Uh, Sorry, let me <clears throat> just interrupt. So the cumulative column there on the far right is so that, you know, if you start with the most cost effective projects that were submitted and you just work your way down the list to however many dollars you have, you know, whether you want to just use the, the five million um, that it, of cash that's available or whether you want to um, substitute out some of those other projects, you can see, you know, how far down the list you can get with various uh, amounts of revenue. <laughs> Okay, um, moving forward, we have a couple of stormwater projects. These two, you'll see the numbers, project numbers are out of order. They are previously approved projects um, asking for the increased cost share. So I put this calculation is including the 214 and the 231 for each of these. 
because the other money is already allocated for those projects. Um, so moving down, um, we've got two more stormwater projects and then a wastewater treatment facility upgrade project for the city of Rockledge. And then we have um, some more living shoreline projects. So again, you, you don't see a cumulative increase here because that funding is already allocated. Um, and then we have a few more stormwater projects here. And then we go into some uh, septic system removals for Satellite Beach. We have a small dredging project for the city of Melbourne. And then we have some of the county projects um, and other septic to sewer projects. Request a couple years ago, they were approved for less than $1,500 a pound, so now they're asking for the $1,500 a pound. And so you'll see the difference over in the notes column, the 724, so that number was um, added to the cumulative um, amount. And then there's a couple of new ones. So we have um, the city of West Melbourne submitted two projects, Lake Ashley Circle, and uh, Dundee Circle and Manor Place. And then the remaining are um, the county, pro oh wait, we have uh, City of Coco J and K, also requesting um, the higher cost share. And they had updated numbers for their projects. And then the, uh, um, the remaining are based off of the, the dollar amount for the um, increased cost share. And I also have the grants listed here for the different projects. Sorry? Zoom still sees the map. Sorry? Zoom still sees the oh, map. Oh, so Okay. Sorry, Vinny. Hang on. <laughs> I got to stop sharing. No, you're good. You're good. I, 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 you I've got it. Okay. But uh, just for the public. Hold on. How do I make you big? I don't want to exit minimized. I want to make it big. Share. Okay, can you see the spreadsheet now? Okay. Yeah. All right. So, uh, based off of the number numbers that Virginia gave earlier, we could go to the five million. What was it? Five point two. So that would get us to about um, this area, you know, South Beaches A and Lake Ashley Circle. So then we could consider um, unfunding the three projects that were mentioned, and that would put us very close to the end here. Can I ask under vegetative har vegetation harvesting, mm -hmm. what uh, does that include? Like most of the other projects are basically self-explanatory, but is that contract with a company purchasing equipment? What does that? The specify? it depends. Um, these particular projects would hire a firm to do the vegetation removal, mm -hmm. and obviously that includes the whole beginning to uh, disposal. Everything yes, that's part of the contract agreement. Okay, thank you. They, they can't just put it on the bank and let it decompose because <laughs> all those nutrients would go right back into the water. They have to properly dispose of it. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And these contracts Well, are, and so let oh, Go ahead, Vinny. Oh, go ahead, Terry. Go ahead, sorry. I was just going to say these are performance-based, so there's a lab analysis required to determine and weigh scales to determine how much nutrients are actually removed, and then their reimbursement is based on that. Okay, so what, what I was thinking we could do um, is we could look through the projects and see if there's any ones we have particular questions about, like Kimberly did with the harvesting. I know I have a few other harvesting questions. And that way we can all get answers to the questions that we have, if we have any, about individual projects. At that point, that way we may feel comfortable with a project or say we don't feel comfortable with a project which would affect our cumulative total numbers. What Virginia is presenting um, is a look at um, replacing three projects with uh, six, how many, 36, 60, whatever number of more efficient if you look at the total nitrogen per dollar. So does that sound like a plan? We'll look at the project, people can pull ones out and ask individual questions if they have any. I got any questions. Courtney? 
So I, I just have a question on, you know, not only the harvesting, but also on kind of the overall concept. The, the harvesting, although I think it's great nutrient reduction, it's a really quick way to get it done. Is there anything that would, you know, I, we might want to have a conversation on whether we want to continue to fund it over and over and over again, or if we just want to do it one time to get that nutrient reduction out, let everybody see it, and then that's the responsibility of the local government to go back and finish those. I'm not, you know, I think we probably at some point need to have that conversation. So that's one. And then the second, just just so, you know, we're clear and the community is clear because, you know, we've, there's been some of us that have been on this board for a long time, so we understand that the, this process. But what it, what Virginia has done is provided some options for projects that clearly are not going to start for a very long time. And what the list that we have here are all projects that are getting ready to start. That they're, and that's why the local governments, including the county, are applying for the funds or at least the um, gap from it, for the septic to sewer. Um, and that way, you know, if we do the project replacement, which I think it's a great idea, um, we will basically be moving up projects into the funding category or funded category that are more likely to be completed in the next couple of years instead of will be completed in five or six years. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what she just laid out for us is the options for projects that are clearly are not ready to go. And if we did replace those projects with these, we would be moving up a bunch of projects that are getting ready to start and um, obviously have what she also showed a better cost per nutrient reduction um, rate than the, the ones that are in the plan now. So I just want to make sure that's clear. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney. Anyone else have any other questions? Stephanie, is that Stephanie? Yes. And it's not really a question, but also a comment dovetailing on what Courtney just said. And that is that the projects that we might be removing, that we potentially are removing, it doesn't mean that they can't be added back in. Mm -hmm. And so as we get closer to that time frame, and as you pointed out, as those sewer lines become available for that cocoa project, it can be added back in mm -hmm. at a much reduced cost savings and we're not tying up these funds and projects that we can't do right away. Right. But it doesn't mean they can't come back. Yes, good point, Stephanie and Courtney. It's about getting it done now. Dr. Windsor, yes. Hi, Vinny. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I had a comment, um, and not so much a question, although I, the question just arose in my mind. Um, the comment, uh, we, we've based a lot of our evaluations, or based all of our evaluations, on dollars per pound of nitrogen. And I keep harping back, and I'm doing this for new members on the committee and for people in the public, there are lots of other benefits to be derived other than removing nitrogen. And it, it bothers me that the state model for calculating nitrogen only includes nitrogen from septic to sewer and doesn't include anything else. And what caught my attention again was all the proposals that list zero for phosphorus removal from septic to sewer. Now, anybody who looked at those has to realize that zero is not real. Mm -hmm. There is some phosphorus being removed in septic to, uh, to sewage, but the people who are applying can't point out that benefit because the state model doesn't include an option of demonstrating how much phosphorus you're removing. So I just want to make it clear that all, all those ones that had zeros in the, for P removal, it's not that they're not doing P removal, it's that they're not measuring it. They can't, they put, can't put an estimated value in because it's not available from the state model. So all those projects with zero P's, they're also removing P, okay, but they just can't put it down on paper. My, my, my question that cropped up was on Sharps A, um, the last one on the list, how many years would that be before that one got into, uh, you know, if time is a factor in this consideration, how long it will be before Sharps get started? So it would also be, you know, four years, whatever, before it was actually constructed. Um, but we now have uh, uh, consultants selected to start the design, and you know it takes two to three years to get them designed and and permitted and acquire the land needed. So, um, you know, I, 
it's, we're, we have a lot of projects that are sort of in that four to five year out time frame. Um, and, and so you're beginning to get to fine hair when you're trying to figure out which could proceed before the other. Thank you. Could I follow up with okay, a question? Okay, David, yeah. Thanks, Vinny. Um, based on something Lorraine said and as well as what John said, uh, you got Sharp Say, which is the southern portion of Merritt Island. We're talking about four to five years to get sewer sent down and constructed low enough to connect those houses to sewer. Sewer is going to <clears throat> remove phosphorus over even advanced septic. Advanced septic generally doesn't remove phosphorus. So is it better for these houses to be converted now in the next five years to advanced septic or to wait and get them on sewer? Because if they are you know, eligible for advanced septic, I assume that would be to the exclusion of connection to sewer in five years. Or is that possibly in addition to? Now that could be the recommendation of the committee. Uh, we could leave that project on the books with just um, several hundred thousand dollars to proceed with design. Uh, we have obviously done very well the last two legislative sessions, um, getting state matching funds to make these local dollars go farther. Uh, so we could go ahead and, and take they you know, leave that project on the books, proceed with design, um, knowing that it's many years before that project would happen and those septic systems are going to continue to load. Um, or we can take the project off the books for now, which would allow us to uh, upgrade septic for anybody in that community that was interested. Um, and, and then, you know, if we have the funding to put that project back in the plan, then yes, there's some redundant money that would have been spent upgrading those septic systems that are then later replaced. I have a quick, if, if we were to do, I would just be afraid that if they were eligible for the advanced septic, that they would be more reluctant to even move towards sewer because they just, <laughs> you know, got this brand new pretty septic tank. And so I, I just, you know, when you, you're basically ha relying on their participation in a septic to sewer conversion. So that would be my, I think it was a great idea to leave it on the books with design funds, or at least to start the design. Um, I think that's a, a fabulous idea because then we can still advocate for legislative dollars and, and you know, even if we have some of these other projects drop off, we can always reallocate it to that. So I think that would be a better idea than to make it eligible for advanced septic. That, that would be my only concern is having um, residents themselves think, well, why would I go to a sewer when I just did all this, you know? Yeah, so this is, um, <clears throat> yeah, you make a good point about the, the imbalance or the, the, the focus on nitrogen removal. Um, but from my layman's perspective, I think what, what, I th what I've taken away from this experience for the last four or five years is that phosphorus is not the big threat to the lagoon. So, sorry, hello, got, got me, Benny? Um, so uh, um, it's this whole trade-off that you're suggesting, right? Is it better to um, uh, keep people on, on aging septic for four or five years while we're waiting for the wheels to turn to be able to connect them to sewer, or is it better to get them on advanced septic now, reduce the nitrogen, it, it, and this is sort of my scientific question to you, is that, uh, you know, what is the, you know, what's the, what's the value of reducing phosphorus if we don't get, you know, the phosphorus removal that we'd like to see or, or we think, you know, we, we might desire? It, it, how does that fit into the trade-off? Because where, where I'm sitting, it makes more sense to, to improve or, or reduce the nitrogen load if, it's, if we can do it this year with advanced septic, let's do it. If we have to wait five years to do it with sewer, that, that to me is not a good trade-off. Um, John, I, I think if we went in and did septic, you know, advanced septic and then went to the sewer, I think there would be an outcry from the citizens 
because it was looking like, God, government can't get their act straight. We just did something three or four years ago. So, you know, maybe we can look at other projects that would also benefit, you know, maybe they're not on the list, but could also realize those reductions in nitrogen and phosphorus instead of, you know, this particular one. I don't think there's a shortage of opportunities to reduce those two nutrients. So I'd be a little skeptical of, you know, putting in one system now and something else five years from now. Just, just add a little. Uh, yeah, Lorraine like, and then David. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Lorraine. Oh, Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say on the Sharp Say project, that area is not very densely populated, and I don't know what the ages of the homes are, but I mean, how many homes are we even talking about in that area? Does anyone have any idea? I know, at some, I know riding my bike that way. Um, a lot of snowbirds, very large lots. The actual, what the actual uh, nitrogen burden is to the lagoon, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, Co Coco is C is 273 properties. Uh huh. Sharps A is 186 properties. Okay. So that's pretty significant, and I don't know the ages of those homes that they're, um, if it's anything like cocoa, they're probably getting to the end of their natural life of the current septics, would you say? Is that yeah. an assumption? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. The, 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 I think the biggest concern with the older septic is if they were installed before the two-foot separation requirement from the groundwater table. Uh -huh. So uh, we have system, you know, older systems that were installed just six inches above the water table, and we know that sea level has risen, you know, five inches in the last 50 years here, and so those older pre-1983 mm -hmm. or 1986 systems um, can't, could be right at the, the high season okay. groundwater table. Thank you. All right, David? Yeah, just to add um, the information that I, looking at this, had found, in general, the, um, it seems like if you go to uh, septic instead of sewer, not only are you, is it difficult to remove the phosphorus from um, septic instead of sewer, but you also do not get the quality of nitrogen reduction. So a, a septic system is not going to, when you have flooded groundwaters, ever going to remove the level of nitrogen from water that can escape that, that sewer can do. So sewer is a better option overall, but there is advanced septic that is available today that can remove phosphorus. However, it is at least as expensive as sewer hookup. So there's your, your trade-off, is you can get single and multi-home advanced uh, septic systems that could be installed that can get rid of nitrogen and phosphorus, but they are not uh, cost competitive against normal septic. If we wanted to make an investment, we might want to look at, I know there's at least one group on site that I'd talked to, and I'm sure there's many that um, are creating systems that could remove that. They just don't feel that that is people aren't generally willing to pay the money to get the phosphorus and, and nitrogen content to match sewer. Uh, but it would be an option where you could do an investment now and get the end result you might be looking for as a possibility. Okay. Um, good discussion on that last project. Uh, yes, yeah, Stephanie. One other consideration is the fact that if you put in an advanced septic system, eventually it is going to fail. So you're, you're putting in an investment that is, is not a long-term investment. And so it clearly is a better option to have those homes go to, to sewer rather than any other option. It just is. Yeah, Courtney. Um, Virginia, what was the project number of the one you presented for Sharps to, to remove? You mean Coco, uh, Coco C? Is that the, the one that you recommended to remove? Coco C. Coco C, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what was that number, project number? No, 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 hang on. 
It is project number 153. And how much money would we have to program to keep that project alive and moving through design, do you think? That one was, oh. I'm, I'm going to phone a friend. <laughs> <laughs> Design. So the design would be somewhere between a, a half to eight hundred thousand. Okay. If we were to go ahead and program like a thirty percent, I mean we'd put in two hundred thousand right now, and then we can add as when staff gets to thirty percent, you can come back. Is that a possibility? Possibility. Um, the way utilities is moving forward to save costs is they have um, lumped all the designs together. Okay. So um, uh, when we bring this news of whatever decision is with them, they're going to have to dig into the details and find the man hours and pull it out just the lump sum. Okay. So. But, but we can just amend the, the task order. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. so could we go ahead and, you know, if we did a motion, could we, you know, ask for Project 153 to um, come back for funding, design funding from us at a later date, and that would be part of the motion. That way we could still, we can have a better look at it after the utility can tell us what they need. I think okay. once, um, the utility feels that once they hit 30%, they will have a much more realistic idea of costs. Okay. And then Anthony, can you speak into the mic? I'm sorry. It keeps cutting in and out. So um, when um, utilities design, when design hits 30% for a utilities project, sewer project, you have a much more realistic idea of what the costs are going to be. So right now there's about 50% contingency planned into these. Mm -hmm. um, that will drop down to 25 30% at 30% design. When you get closer to 75% design, we are we have a number we can sort of start to hang our hat on. Mm -hmm. So to get to, you know, so we could, could we could we put in the motion, project number 153, um, we are requesting to be returned to the utility, ask them to come back with what a 30% design would be, and so that we can keep that project in the books and moving, you know, so that at a later date, if we have the funding, we can put it back in. And I, to, put, to clarify too, I think um, the way their timeline for design would bring it, um, it, it'd be halfway along or at 75% this time next year. Okay. Based on what their projected timeline is. So we would need to do a 75% design to make it worth it then, is that what you're saying? Yeah, they, they think they'll be at 30% this summer. To, to not delay it. To not mm -hmm. delay it, okay. But they're going to be delayed until this plant improvements are done anyway, correct? Construction would be. Correct. Okay. Construction would be. Okay. Okay, hey, Stephanie, yes. Uh, well, I would say the same thing for the Sharp Say project. That both of those projects, if we can, can keep them on the books, whatever that requires, the minimum cost out of the plan to make sure that they are considered viable projects in the plan so that we're not having those people go to, to advanced septic. Could we, it's, I'm sorry, Benny. <laughs> go ahead, Courtney, um, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think that's a good idea if we could send both those back to the utility to ask for their total design costs. And that way, that might be a better chunk to, to move forward with. And then once we get to that point and they have a better idea of what it's going to cost and, and we start looking for legislative funds. And, the, and you guys, if you look at the grants on this page, I mean, you, the, the county is a grant machine. Um, and I think, you know, that, that's the other option so that these longer term projects, maybe we can fund finally when there's a better number to fund. Yeah. Okay. okay, so it sounds like what the committee is moving toward um, is looking at approving, um, modifying the plan with the projects we have listed 
including keeping both Coco A and um, uh, uh, Sharp A on the book. Coco C and Sharp A. Coco C, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's that's what it sounds like I'm hearing from the committee. Yeah. Um, is that I'd like to any is that, is that is that about right? Everyone feel comfortable with that? Yes. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think I think um, Courtney's done a great job of sort of summarizing and, and coming forward with a, with an innovative idea. I just want to comment on the on the uh, it, 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 it's um, it's in, uh, irrefutable that that sewer is a better long term solution than septic. But if we take your disposition to its conclusion, we should not be investing any money in advance septic because it's not the long-term solution that is in your view optimum that, that's not what I was saying the 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 issue is in some places there it, there are no other options there's no sewer connection that's ever going to be available or within the next 20 or 30 years is going to be available and so for those situations advanced septic is the best option. But, but we know these projects have sewer connections coming. And so we don't want to forestall that. Exactly what Courtney was saying, we don't want to forestall that. So no, I'm not saying that it's never an option. I'm saying you have to look at the individual circumstances and determine what is the best option. And, and that's, I think that's what we're struggling with. And, and the issue is, your, to your point, it's, it's about timing, right? Do we wait five years to get a perfect solution or do we do something now that's an 80% solution? And the problem that I see is that the load on the lagoon is right now. If, I, if, we, you know, if, we, if we continue at the rate we're going now, in five years we won't have a lagoon. So, you know, we need to be doing things that make a difference now. And, and I'm not, this is, this is not to say I'm, you know, not in favor of, of, uh, of Courtney's suggestion. I'm not in favor of trying to push uh, septic conversions, sewer conversions forward as fast as we can. I'm just pointing out that there is, an, there is a, a sense of urgency um, to, to be doing things now. And and I, I, I also have a sense of urgency, so I'm going to make a motion. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but one thing I wanted to quickly ask, are there any projects on here? I need to remove a project and have a separate motion that I can abstain from. So is there anyone else on the committee that has that same issue? So I do as well. I have two projects <laughs> that I need to abstain from. Um, and I had some additional questions, but um, oh, okay. if we want to make a motion, Courtney, or if someone wants to make a motion, if removing the one that you need to abstain from and the two that I need to abstain from, yes. um, then we can go ahead and pass that motion, have discussion, a motion in the second, and then we can take that one separately. So okay. um, the motions, the, the projects that I need to abstain from are Project 209 and... Um, project 220. Okay. And, Vinny, do, do I need to abstain from? If you have city cocoa projects, then I would yeah. recommend that you do that. I would recommend, I would recommend it, Lorraine. That's okay. up to you, but I would recommend it. Uh, Vinny, do, do you have any uh, explanation? Why, you're you're, you're uh, arguing to remove these two projects, harvesting and the uh, bio no, you, you're, you're saying you have to question, abstain. Yes, yeah, so thank you for the question. It is um, my family owns the property that the vegetative harvesting will be um, done on. And so I want to make sure to remove any perception that um, I'm passing a vote in favor of, of, you know, of ourselves, our family, um, because of the property that we own. There's, there's, let me just clarify, there's public drainage that goes through his family's property. Okay. So it's just and so this is not a project that we've brought. Um, I, I, I found out about this project when the, when the project list came out. 
but I don't feel that it's right that I vote on something that could negative, positively or negatively affect um, my, myself or my family. Okay. So, um, Lorraine, I think I have yours. It's 31 and yeah. 32, yeah. Okay. So, um, I'll make a motion to recommend modification of the Save Our Indian River Lagoon project plan to include all the projects on the 2022 project funding request list with the exception of the project number 222, project number 209, project number 220, and project number 2016-3132. Okay, is there a I, second? I, I can second that, but uh, could I ask, wouldn't it just be easier that we include all the projects and you folks just abstain from the voting on those individual numbers? I do that in the county commission meeting all the time for the consent agenda. Um, we would have to abstain on the whole vote. No, you could just abstain on the specific projects, can't you? I think you? the process that they had laid out was probably the, the easiest way of doing okay. it. Okay, so all you right. just carve I, it I out and then you can abstain up, from the other one. Second. <laughs> all right, I'm still confused. Okay, there's I, 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 oh, I still ahead, have Terry. to. I still got to finish the second one, um, and then we're recommending to um, for projects numbered 153 and 2627 um, to re be returned to the utility and for further review and to come back to the committee for reconsideration at a later date, primarily to include project design funds for those projects. You want to include project design funds now. Or you want the utility to tell you what the project design would That's cost yes. and you want that approved. At a late, I think we need to do that at a later date because we don't have those funds. Or do we, can we, do you have an estimate? <laughs> um, so okay. we, we need to get your list today so that we can put it into the plan and balance all the numbers and bring you a draft plan um, in January. Uh, if we, if you make a determination now, we don't need to meet in December. If you want utilities to bring those costs back, um, we could have a, a quick meeting in December with just those numbers. Um, or if you want to give us a, a range. Uh, I think if you, there's, so. there's a million, um, 1.6 million difference between going to the second to the bottom project and you know all the way down to the bottom of the list. So that 1.6 million is enough to For do the, to design the of both projects. That would be, okay, so let's switch that then. <laughs> all right, so let me just do the whole thing again. Because it's, so you got the first part of the motion. Everybody got that one. So we'll also add to that motion for projects numbered 153 and 2627, we're approving 1.6 million for design cost for those projects. Okay. And I'll second that motion. Okay. All right, so we've got a motion and a second to improve all the projects except for those four and then bring those two back. So this would be the time if anybody has any individual questions on projects, I know I do, but does anybody have any questions on any projects or any further discussion and then we will have to take public comment as well. Oh, that's what I was gonna say. Oh. I'm getting there, just long-winded. Yes, Kimberly, go ahead and then Charles. Thank you. On the vegetation harvesting again, um, is there any maintenance into that or is it just one initial removal and then the site is cleared and then it's left up to the Cocoa Beach or Brevard County yes. to maintain? Yes. So with these projects, currently they are spraying herbicides. So this is reducing the herbicide use and then the plants decay get the water. So that's manually removing them. Um, it is based, performance based one time uh, per contract, you know. 
And are there bids now? Will that go up for bid, or how does that? Uh, yes, I mean the city of Cocoa Beach would be responsible for theirs, and the county would be responsible. What we have our own um, vegetation harvesting team, so they would be do the counties, most the, likely. The county does have its own working, and so that could be who does that, and the cost would still be the same if it was the county versus the contract. If it's cheaper for us to bid it out and do it that way, we could, but it's since we have our own team and equipment, it's usually... Yeah, I think that's great. I'm all for vegetation mm -hmm. harvesting, by the way. I was just curious how that maintenance program works, just applicable to other projects mm -hmm. also. So thank you. Mm -hmm. and just to add to that, that at least in Cocoa, we found that to be very reasonable, the maintenance on it, so um, we were surprised. So. Yeah, what we found is that once you do that initial harvest, you know, you remove an enormous load from the system. And so the, the vegetation comes back much more slowly, mm -hmm. right? It took decades for there to mm -hmm. be, build up enough nutrients to grow that much vegetation. And so uh, these projects tend to, to last longer than you would expect. Mm -hmm. So and Kimberly, some... it's, not, it's not unlike a baffle box, right? We invest in the, in the uh, uh, creation of a baffle box, but the entity then is responsible for that quarterly or monthly <coughs> or maintenance of that. Yes, and my question, Virginia sort of answered as well, just in regard to, like, what does that look like? And, and it's very effective to stay, and, and the maintenance is minimal, so that's great. Thank you, Terry. So, you know, one of okay, the things, Carl? there's a couple external factors that we haven't really talked about during this discussion. So this is more of a comment, but, uh, and I think going forward with projects that are near ready to go are smart because we have the inflation issue. So we don't know how that's going to impact us. Is it going to go away? Is it going to keep growing? So I, I, I pause when I think about the future projects that we have and how our Revenue, you know, may not be able to meet all our project uh, funding. And then the other thing, of course, is the infrastructure bill that was passed. Uh, you know, so, you know, what might we benefit from that? You know, so, you know, maybe they'll balance each other. But just we need to keep those things in mind, I think, as we go forward with our project approvals. If, if I can. Okay, thank you, Charles. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Anyone else? Vinny, if I can address the, that inflation question. So um, I have a set of slides prepared um, for, for the inflation conversation. Um, obviously, uh, things are a little, little crazy right now, and nobody's crystal balls are particularly good. Um, the inflation on uh, plumbing-related projects uh, currently is sitting between 7.8 and 8 um, percent. Inflation on concrete pipes is a little higher than that, so for stormwater projects that use a lot of reinforced concrete pipe. Um, but uh, compared to the revenue coming in, we have seen a 14 percent increase in revenue this year. And so, and, and then we have uh, we're budgeting for inflation, and we are budgeting a contingency. So uh, we, I think that the what you all have put into place, the safeguards that you've put into place, um, really should work well through this wobble. And uh, you know, we'll come again next year and look at you know how we need to to rebalance the plan. Um, I believe maybe Vinny asked, you know, if if inflation does something totally uh, unexpected that is deleterious to the plan, there is nothing that prevents the committee from recommending a plan revision, you know, mid-year or, you know, earlier than waiting for a year. So um, I just... Mm -hmm. you're, you're absolutely right, you know, that is, and, and certain, the sooner we can get these things done, the sooner we know what those costs are and the less we have that compounded inflation uh, going out in time. But we have uh, compounded inflation built into the plan, so there are, there are protections. Okay, thank you, Virginia. And I know that is on all our minds, trying to make sure that we're doing our fiduciary duty, so I do 
I uh, appreciate all the questions and the points. So nobody else has any other questions. If not, I've got a few on some of those projects, Virginia. Uh, the first one, and I know it was mentioned, the uh, vegetative harvesting. Uh, I know some of them are the county and some of them are the city of Cocoa. Um, I, I, I don't know, and I don't know if it's beneficial, but I know the county has their own machine. I don't think the city of Cocoa Beach does. I didn't know if there was a way to combine harvesting in the county that would be as efficient financially as it can be, and maybe this is it. Um, but just a way to pool resources, just like we're pooling tax dollars with this, um, you know, with this initiative. So that would be my only comment, is if the entities could at least talk to each other to make sure that they're, and they probably already are, just that they could make sure that we're using the resources that we have available to their fullest. I, I will respond that the county's team is busy uh, every day harvesting, and we are looking at whether we need to add a second team. Um, so uh, we, d we do not have the capacity to um, work on the city's projects as well. I had hoped that we would be able to, but uh, that, is, that is not uh, feasible currently. Um, well, and that, and that makes sense. And, and I think the fact we are harvesting more is great news. As Kimberly said, I read all the time about people talking about herbicide usage. And so I think the more harvesting we can do, the better. And uh, maybe we have to buy another harvester. Maybe I'll buy a harvester and retire and become a harvester driver in my mm -hmm. spare time. That sounds like fun mm -hmm. and dangerous. So, hey, um, hey okay. Vinny. Well, thank you for that, Virginia. Vinny, yeah. Sa Satellite Beach is, we're looking to get our harvester coming in in a couple weeks. And Cocoa Beach can buy our harvester anytime they want. So just letting them know. <laughs> That's awesome, and I love that, and I think that's the exact example of this whole initiative, is our county working together, so that's fantastic. And if I can take it for a spin too, Courtney, let me know. I'd we'll like let that you drive well. it anytime so, you want. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sounds like fun. We, we will need to fence that off, Terry. I don't want any children <laughs> nearby. That would be very dangerous. Um, so anyways, the next question that I had, uh, on the Titusville Causeway multi-trophic restoration, that one says there was an FDEP proposal submitted, um, but it wasn't secured yet. And so if that FDEP funds come in, obviously that gets taken off mm -hmm. the tax funds, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it depends on what the funding level is from the states. We should hear in December. Um, the We submitted it to two different programs, one that provides 100% funding, one that provides 50% funding. We've also submitted a legislative appropriations request that um, uh, Representative Soroy's office is sponsoring. So uh, lots of irons in the fire trying to get that project funded and, and certainly uh, the the lagoon tax could just make up the the delta of mm -hmm. you know whatever isn't funded some other way. Okay, great. Um, I only have uh, three other questions. Sorry, I'll be quick. The previously approved and requesting additional funding; those are all projects that were approved at a level lower than what we said the maximum is, and now they're all coming back asking for the maximum, but nothing more than the maximum. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, great. Okay, well, uh, well, another question, the Sandpoint Park Baffle Box in the city of Titusville, they mentioned the clear top. I think it was Danny with the city of Melbourne who said, don't do a clear top. So Titusville, if you're listening, don't do a clear top. Maintenance is really hard, right, Danny? Mm -hmm. I'm still gonna try it. <laughs> <laughs> She's nodding and shouting yes from the back of the room. Again. <laughs> and then on Project 215, there was no description. It was based in 960 Pioneer Road denitrification. And the said project description was no. Hold on, let me look that up real quick. So Pioneer yeah. Road is, a, is on Merritt Island, and there's a ditch that goes along a north-south road and then turns east-west, and the depth of that ditch is just perfect for growing a lot of weeds that then when we have a heavy rain, they float and detach and are scoured from the banks and washed through a large box culvert into a canal where they fall and rot and all the homeowners take videos of all the vegetation washing from the ditch into their canal um, and, and uh, they're not happy with us. So uh, I happen to know uh, that project. Um, it's been on a 
been on a hot burner here for a while. Um, and so there, you'll see that um, they're looking at a number of improvements at that site, but including uh, changing the configuration of that ditch to make it uh, perform for flood relief as well as providing uh, water quality treatment and avoiding the, the vegetation problem we have. Cool. Okay, great. Okay, then maybe we could update that in the packet or online, Virginia, so that way it's in the packet. Or I guess the plan will have it in it anyways when we update the project plan um, in January. Um, and then the last, my last one was the uh, Oyster Project's offshore reef. So is this the first offshore reef that we're funding? Because I know the project mentions that this is new and different because it's offshore. Yeah, and I think offshore is, I, I don't know that that's the best um, word choice there, but typically we have been building them as bars shore parallel within 10 feet of the mean high water line to um, follow the easiest permitting path. And the idea with these is to get them further from the shoreline than 10 feet. Um, perhaps maybe in water that is so deep that seagrasses aren't going to grow there anyway uh, and see if um, we have a whole nother area of the lagoon where we could grow oysters that would not be competing with seagrass habitat area. Great. That was, that was my thought and I wanted to just bring that, uh, bring that up because I think that's a good idea. Hopefully we can get those reefs to continue to grow like we did the other ones. Um, okay, those are my questions. I'm sorry, everybody, but that's, that's all I have. So we have a motion and we have a second. We've had discussion, so now I think we need to take public comment. Any public comment on the motion on the floor? You have somebody in the room, Vinny. Is this public comment yes. just in general? Or? No, it's no, on, it's no on, on, on the motion. <coughs> Sorry. Oh, okay. This is just for on the motion on the floor. So any public comment on the motion on the floor? Okay. Seeing none, we'll go ahead and uh, take a vote. So all those in favor of the motion on the floor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, it passes unanimously. Okay. And okay, I'll do so now we have the four projects that were pulled out. Okay, I'll uh, do. I'll make a motion. Trying to think how to do this. <laughs> I'll make a motion um, for um, approving the um, two project number two thousand nine, project number two twenty, and project number twenty sixteen thirty one thirty two in the 22 or 2022 project funding request list. Second. And recommending approval to that was the commission. 209, I think 209, Courtney. 209, 220, 2016, 31, and 32. Okay, now I can't vote on the, the, the 20, 220 or 209, but that works, we're good. So is, there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? And of course I'm up Second. Okay. Any any discussion? Any public comment? Uh, Mr. Chair, I think I have a question. Were you supposed to break those out individually so that uh, oh, Ms. Sure. Coss could vote yes. on hers? And okay. Then yes, you're right. I'm sorry. Okay. So um, we'll recommend approval or recommend including projects number 209 and 220 in the 22 project funding request list. Thank you, yes, okay, so is there a second? And this is one I will abstain from. Second. Second. Okay, any discussion? Any public comment? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. All right, Courtney, if you want to make the motion for the range, and then we'll make the motion, someone else will make it for satellite beef. Okay. So um, make a motion to recommend modification of Save Our Indian River Lagoon project plan to include the project number 2016-3132 in the 2022 project funding request list. Second. 
Okay. All right, there's a motion and a second. Any discussion? Any public comment? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And and Lorraine, all right. you're so now we just need a motion for satellite be satellite beats. I'll move to approve that project into the plan for 2021-22. Second. Okay, any discussion? All right, any public comment? All righty, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, we made it through. Congratulations, everybody. Good job. All right, so the next and final item on our agenda before our general public comment is our meeting schedule for uh, next year. Motion to approve. Second. Okay. All right. Is there a discussion? Any discussion? Okay, doesn't seem to be any discussion. Any public comment? Nope, I think they all want us to meet the same way we do, so that's fantastic. All right. Vinny, we have three uh, public Terry, comments. Yes? Right. Yeah. Oh yeah, this is for the motion to uh, uh, approve our meeting schedule. Oh, okay, I just wanted to make sure. Are those public comments for the agenda item or general? General. Okay. All right. So we've got a second. No discussion. No general comment for our meeting schedule. So we'll take the vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All righty. We've got our meeting schedule for next year. Okay, the next thing now is general public comment. So I do have uh, one public card and I know there were two others that were sent up. So we'll go ahead and do public comment. Please remember you have three minutes. Our first person is Clint Wilson. Hi Clint. Hey Vinny, how you doing? <laughs> first off, I'm doing I all right, man. I'll be doing better than more. Well, first I'll say thank you. I was here at a meeting a couple months back, and Courtney and Dave and Miss Laura Lee and yourself, Vinny, kind of stood up for me about what I was trying to do to help me keep going, because all the no's I hear, every time I hear a little bit of good things, it kind of helps keep me going, because uh, I hear a whole lot more no's than I do yes. <laughs> so I do thank you all for your support and having good things to say. Uh, I do have a couple of things I'd like to find out more about. One is the harvesting. Uh, you know, me being here local and all, I would love to see about getting into some of the harvesting to get some of the green material out of the water before it has a chance to die and rot and create the nitrogen. And uh, so I'd like to find out more about that for myself as far as the nitrogen credits that are allowed for the weight of the material and how much the money is. I mean, there's so much of it I don't understand or know because there are some projects that would be small enough for an individual, a small company to come in and be able to clean up their cell. Like over in Titusville, I know there's a couple of ponds that are right there beside the lagoon, which they have no access to really getting big equipment into because there's a guardrail and a couple of small ponds and then the lagoon to where an individual could come in and take care of cleaning up. Like there in front of y'all's office, the cattails and all, all that water runs directly into the lagoon. And the stuff actually needs to grow because it's absorbing the nitrogen. So there's things where we can come in two times of the year, like in the middle of the season, so you can come in and cut it out, trim it out, let it come back. And then at the fall, we'll be there to take it out before it has a chance to rot out and die and create the extra nitrogen. So there are a lot of projects like that that someone like myself, a local, can take care of. So I'd like to find out what I could about that. And uh, there again, that's about the biggest thing for now. And I'm still fighting, trying to do my aeration and my habitat. So. If anybody needs any assistance there as far as what can I do, 
please contact me. I can do everything I can do. And uh, there again, the people that have been talking and had good things to say last time, even though I was a little bit of a smart aleck when I left, <laughs> I do appreciate y'all. So that's all there is to it. You're saying thank you, Vinny. All right, Clint. Thank you so much. And yeah, we'll be in touch about that harvesting. I think that's great to have somebody who wants to do some work and do some harvesting for some smaller jobs. So we'll see what we can do to set you up. And I want to say one other thing. Commissioner Pritchett always says you catch more bees with honey. But with me, I think you catch more bees with, with lemon. I like somebody who's a little sour. Don't worry, they're going to be a whole lot of lemon in your life. As long you. as I'm around, they're going to be a whole lot of lemon around. <laughs> And, and I said, thank you, you again. So thank you for your passion. Thank you. Thank you for your passion, Clint. Okay. Um, I don't have another card, but I know there are other people. Uh, next person for public comment, please state your name. Clint Wilson. That was Clint. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Steve Hancock. Good morning. Um, some of you may remember me from the last meeting last month. Um, I'm uh, Steve Hancock from Sunnyland Beach, which is a uh, community, a canal front community in the southern part of the county, about six miles north of the Sebastian Inlet on the Barrier Island. Um, we actually have about five miles of the shoreline of the Indian River Lagoon. Um, everything septic tanks. Um, the neighborhood was, I guess, platted out in the 70s. Um, and it's actually, as, as I talked about a little bit last month, it's an area of um, really special um, environmental significance. Uh, we talked about, I think I spoke about a lot of the manatees. Um, we, we one time counted 78 manatees in the canal behind our house. Um, dolphin are there frequently. Um, just to give you an idea of the significance, we saw this Sunday night, three houses down from us. I don't know if folks in there can see, but that is one of about the most be beautiful bald eagle you could ever imagine. Um, a, he was a monster compared to the one you see at the Brevard Zoo. Um, our community is extremely engaged in the environmental situation in our, in, in our community, and the canals in particular. Uh, this is just, uh, this is a, a picture I took um, at our last environmental advocacy committee meeting uh, was held at one of the residents' houses and um, Carlos Cuevas from the stormwater division came out and spoke to us. Um, but we have a number of initiatives in this committee that are underway. Um, most of them revol revolving around the water, uh, the water situation. Uh, we also have um, uh, a group that's looking into uh, the mosquito control, which in particular the no CMs that are bad in our area, um, not exactly related to the lagoon, but all, although I suspect a lot of things are all connected because right now the approach towards mosquito and no CM control is spray poison around. I imagine a lot of that affects the, the larger ecosystem. Um, but we've actually undertaken some projects already. Uh, here's one that um, one of our residents did. Uh, and Carlos uh, saw this. We have a lot of these storm drains throughout the neighborhood. They are really, really low tech. They just flow directly out into the canals. So everything from the yard just runs all downhill into one of these drains, through a pipe underground, out to the canal. Um, what we've started doing, uh, uh, Carlos referred to this as a low impact development. We're planting native filtering plant buffers around these drains. We want to encourage uh, work with owners to get them to do some of this, uh, th these kind of plant filtering plant buffers along their seawalls so we don't have the grass running all the way down to the seawall. Um, sorry, did I use up my three minutes? Okay. You did, and, but if you, if you could wrap it up, that'd be yeah, good. So, yeah, let, good. Me, so let me just summarize. So our community is engaged. We're trying to do what we can. But we need, to, we need to figure out how to get Sunnyland Beach listed as some of the line items in these, uh, for projects in these, in these spreadsheets because the muck accumulation is really bad in the canals. We, we badly need muck dredging. Um, these uh, plant buffers are great, but they're probably not going to be enough. We, we probably need to look at some kind of baffle boxes. And also, we do have some residents who are looking at doing the septic, advanced septic conversion, myself included. 
Uh, they also shared some of the concerns that were articulated here with like, is that really a good solution? And is this thing going to require a lot of maintenance? And are they just going to come through and do septic in a few years anyway? How many times do I want to dig up my front yard? So anyway, that's what I would, you know, I'd, I'd love to speak with anybody who can help us get, get Sunnyland on the map, on the spreadsheets, get projects defined uh, to address some of these issues. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, and thank you for coming back. I can't tell you, after last meeting, I had a bunch of people reach out to me and ask me for your name and contact information because they were interested in helping you, and I'm sure you're going to get more. So thank you. Thanks for being a concerned citizen and coming in. Thank you. Thank you. And I think there's one more, Virginia, one more public comment. Lori Geiser. Yes. Good morning, everyone. I thank you very much for the opportunity to speak and to have our concerns aired. Um, I'm also a resident of Sunnyland Beach. You know, our concerns range from the properties that have been there for 40 plus years with their original septic systems um, to the point of the conversation that was being had here today. As a community, it made me begin to think about the needs of our residents. How do we make that decision whether to promote to them septic conversions to more modern systems right now? Or do we look to sewer in the system? We certainly don't want to rat hole money. We'll burn people out very quickly if they put in a big financial investment only to be asked for another one and a lot of disruption a short period of uh, time down the road. Um, so we would like, we would very much like some discussion about our specific neighborhood, about what is a better direction for us to take in the short term. And I view that short term as the next three to five years so that we can make a credible recommendation to our neighbors on how to proceed on that front. Um, I'm also, I'm one, of, I'm working for one of the subcommittees. Um, I volunteer with the University of Florida and with IFAS and the extension offices, and I'm looking at all the ways that we can do low impact developments at the seawalls, around the buffers, anywhere that we have. We've lost a lot of the swales in the neighborhood because of re-landscaping and development, and so they're not flowing the way that they're intended to. So we've got a lot of opportunities there, but it would be helpful if we can connect with some grants or some funding in order to sometimes, in just some cases, to buy plants or to do a little bit of swale redevelopment throughout our neighborhood. So we would be looking for ways to connect with that. Um, Da, 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 da. Yeah, that, that really that covers. You know, we we've got a whole we've got a whole list of initiatives that we want to undertake, and we view them as all being connected to one another. But we really want to put our hands in 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 partnership and look for ways to to make it better in that short term, um, but also to be con cognizant of what we are going to do in the future and lay a bit of a ground map so that we can build that large consensus. And we also don't want to be here just saying, well, would you just hand us out some money? We want to be able to come back to you in the future and show you the progress that we've made and talk to you about the initiatives that we've uh, authorized or, 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 or that we're pursuing in our working groups so that you can have ideas um, and also give us additional ideas that we haven't considered already for making future impacts. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. And I, I think, again, your passion shines through. So thank you for coming out and speaking. And uh, um, Virginia, maybe we can take a look and see if there's any low-hanging fruit in that area um, that we could put in some projects or some, some funds that way. We'll have staff take a look at it, Vinny. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other general public comment? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and go to final comments by chair and committee members. Any committee members have any comments? All right. I can say this is weird. Oh, go ahead, Courtney. Yes, please. It's hard for you to see. I'm like, me. I feel like a little kid in class, like, me, me, me. Um, I just wanted to say, I, this is the first time I've seen a neighborhood come up here. So that's really cool. And I just wanted to thank you guys for, for doing that. I am going to drive down and look at your neighborhood. I, and I have some questions for you after the meeting, if you can just hang out. So, um, But I just wanted to say that, that you know, we get a lot of um, you know, activists and things like that. But for a neighborhood to come together like that for the concern for the lagoon is really cool. And I just wanted to thank you. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much. 
Okay, anybody else have any other comment? I've got to um, <laughs> go quick. I'm going to take a screenshot of my screen here because it's just so weird seeing this 360 camera. I've never seen this before, but uh, it's been cool. Um, thank you to the committee. Thank you to Virginia and your staff and Logan. And oh, John, yes, Vin Dr. Windsor. Vinny, um, if we, uh, based on the motions, I do not believe you need to meet in December. We can. Um, have a nice Christmas break and we can focus on taking all of your motions and getting that integrated into a balanced plan to bring back to you in January. Second. Just kidding. <laughs> so I was going to say, I was going to say, would you like a motion, Virginia? Would you like a motion to cancel that meeting? That, or that would good? be great. Yes. Okay. Motion to cancel the December meeting. Second for real. Okay. Any discussion? Any public comment? Please, nobody in the public ask us to stay. All right, it sounds good. We'll go ahead and take a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, sounds good. Um, again, thank you everybody for coming in, your passion on this. This project thing is one of the biggest things we do a year, so thank you. Uh, Virginia, you and your staff, thank you very much. And Logan and uh, Government TV, thank you all. Uh, have a great uh, rest of your holidays, and we'll see everybody in January. The opinions expressed by any member of the public during any period of public comment do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of the Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County, Florida, Space Coast Government Television, or the program sponsor and are solely those of the presenter. The Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County, Florida, Space Coast Government Television, and the program sponsor hereby expressly disclaim any and all responsibility or liability for any defamatory or slanderous statements expressed by any member of the public during any such period.